This class is part of the series on the Minor Prophets taught in the winter spring semester of Michigan Bible School in the facilities of Church of Christ West in Plymouth, Michigan during January to April 2015. Obadiah, as you know, is the shortest book in the Old Testament and so hopefully we won't be here all night looking at some of what's on here. Just a quick review of some of the basic things that we, we have been talking about from the beginning with regard to the minor prophets. A prophet is a spokesman or a speaker uh, in general. That's what the, that's what the word is. Uh, it uh, is almost never used in our culture other than in a religious context. And so in that context is certainly a, a spokesman for God. It's, a prophet is someone to whom God directly gave a message to be delivered to somebody else. These men all preached mouth to ear, uh, but they have written down, or someone has written down from their preaching, uh, a summary of uh, their message and has preserved that for us. So we don't have their, their voice, but we have their words. And so a, a prophecy then is that which a prophet speaks. It is some sort of an utterance. Uh, literally, the word is oftentimes translated a load or a burden that might be carried, uh, such as a, a box that you'd pick up and carry. And so when we get a little bit further down in some of these books, we're going to see the burden of the Lord to the burden of the, of the country of so-and-so, the burden of. You're going to see that word several times. And it just simply means the prophecy to those people or about those people. All right, let's look a little bit more directly at Obadiah. We've talked about the inspiration of the Old Testament prophets. Obadiah has four specific statements, only 21 verses in the book. So here about one out of five verses, a little less frequently than Amos, who was a little better than one out of three. Obadiah a little bit less than one out of four, I mean uh, one out of uh, five, but um, still that's significant number of statements, hey, God said this. I ain't making this up. This came directly from God. You know, Paul in Galatians chapter 1 said the same thing. He said, you know, this isn't from man. This is, this is from God. He said the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. This isn't words which man's wisdom teaches. It's words which God's, which the Holy Spirit teaches. So, uh, claims of inspiration. God said this. Now, if we were in a debate class or if we were in an apologetics class, that would not be sufficient. Anybody can say, hey, I'm a so-and-so, you know. I'm a teacher, I'm a preacher, I'm a lawyer, I'm a doctor, you know, whatever. I'm a policeman. So the simple fact that he said, God said this, doesn't necessarily prove anything. But it certainly goes a long way toward establishing a, a platform for proof. If you were in a court of law, the first thing you'd start with is uh, what the defendant said about himself. I'm not guilty. All right, we're going to have to evaluate that. And we're going to have to go through the whole legal process and find every scrap of evidence that we can find and then determine whether or not your statement is true. So if we were in an apologetics class, we would start with a statement, God said this, and then we would look at a lot of other evidence. So when I tell you, uh, as we go through these books, that so and so many times it says it came from God, that's a significant statement. But don't take it as ultimate proof because you'll be talking to people out there who don't believe God. If you believe that the Bible is true, that you've done all that study through all your life and as long as you've been in the church, uh, you've, come to a, you've, you've come to the point that you, if you read it in the, in the pages of the Bible, you, you accept the fact that it's true. So God said this, aha, you know, uh, this book, you didn't find this prophecy came from God. But most people in the world aren't going to do that. So don't expect them to. That's all I'm saying. If you want to study with people like that, you're going to have to be able to defend that statement just as you would defend that defendant in a court of law. Just say, you're the lawyer, you're, the, you're that guy's attorney, he says, I'm not guilty. You've got to be able to defend that statement. So if you're out teaching the Bible, and the, and the book says this came from God, you have to be able to defend that statement. That's not the purpose of this class, okay? That's just free extra stuff. You don't have to write that down. That won't be testable. But it's something that you do want to remember as you're trying so to teach. In other words, apologetic is a person that defends the truth. 
Uh, apologetics is the, uh, the science or the, the study of, of uh, weighing evidence. Uh, so looking, looking, looking at the evidence for or against uh, a specific thing. When we use the word in religious circles, apologetics is a study of the evidence in favor of the existence of God and the truth of the Bible. Okay? Yep. So that's where we go from there. All right, let's just move on. The name Obadiah means a servant of the Lord. When you see in the Old Testament a name, and there are many of them, that end in the word I-A-H, names of towns, names of regions, names of people, that I-A-H is an abbreviation or a representation of the name Yahweh. And so it's something about God. When you see that in there, this means something about God. So what does the first part of that word mean? In this case, he's a servant of the Lord. We don't know anything else about Obadiah. 21 verses, this little short book that we have from him, is not much evidence, and there's nothing else about him anywhere in Scripture, at least nothing that clearly is about him. Jeremiah does make a, a reference that could possibly be an allusion to a portion of the book of, of uh, Obadiah, but uh, uh, there are, you know, many uh, believe that it is and many believe that it isn't. But mostly we just say, hey, there's nothing else about Ob Obadiah written anywhere in the Bible, Old Testament or New Testament. There are 19 other occasions, appearances of this name in Scripture. Because that list is so long, I didn't make a chart on that like I did with Joel. But uh, those, uh, if you study through those other names, they are 11 different people in different time frames and different places. They don't refer to this particular man. So the name is common. But this particular man is, uh, is, is unique in this particular book. This book is all we know about this man, and th what uh, it tells us about this man is all we know. Uh, I, I, I mean, the man's all we know about the book, and the book is all we know about the man. Yeah. Again, the shortest chapter in the Old Testament, one chapter, I mean, shortest book, tw one chapter, 21 verses. We don't even know what the date of this book is. It's probably the hardest Old Testament book to date, or at least the hardest of the prophets to date. We know that it was after the first carrying away of the Jews. You know, the Jewish, uh, the, the, the Jews, uh, Judah, went into captivity in three stages. Some of them were carried off, and then later some more, and then later some more. And we know that this was at least after the first carrying away, because some of the folks are already in captivity. We can see that in verse 11. But they hadn't come back yet. There were still some in captivity. So it was between the first deport, uh, deportation and the first return. That's all we can know. It's during the time, at least of the early stages, of the Babylonian captivity. More than that, we cannot say. It could be much later. It could be, you know, down to the time of Nehemiah. It could be uh, in the time of... Uh, of uh, Jehoiakim, but between there is a lot of years, so we just don't know when it was. And the prophecy is not to Israel, and it's not to Judah. This is the first one that we've encountered that is to a foreign nation. All of the Bible is not written to Israel. Did you know that? This book is written to the Gentiles, written by a Hebrew in the Hebrew language, but it was written to Edom. Let's look a little. Edom, Esau. All right, that's very good. Who is Edom? Edom is a, that's another name for Esau, who was the twin brother of Jacob. He was the older brother of Jacob. He was called Esau first, and then he was called Edom. Why was he called Edom? He was red. Uh, he, he was his, when he was born. He was just red all over. Uh, his, red, his skin was red. Well, most of us are. But um, that's just hair. what they called it, huh? Would and hairy, hair. red all over and hairy. Is it was said? Red hair, was it just red? He was red all over and hairy. That's what Je the book of Genesis says. So that's like, you know, I, I don't know if it's red hair, red skin, or what. But yeah, Edom means red. So he was called Edom. And Edom, as a country, is located down here south of Moab. 
uh, south of the southern end of the uh, Dead Sea and uh, across, and again, as I said last week, the uh, borders, the boundaries of these countries varied uh, greatly from time to time. Edom ultimately at one point spread clear off to the east all the way to about the uh, river of Egypt, which was, uh, doesn't show on this map, but as you come up from the uh, Gulf of Aqaba, you know, you got the Red Sea and then it's got two fingers that stick up and you come up here and then there's a, a little stream on some maps that goes off this way. The valley, the Jordan Valley goes up this way and there's a little stream over here. That's called the River of Egypt and it was the southwestern border of Judah uh, at their greatest extent. Uh, and sometimes Edom goes almost over all uh, to that. But across here, south of Moab, south of the Dead Sea and across the desert there. He was, uh, he, was, he, he was the brother of Jacob, but he became a very strong enemy to the people. And that probably stems from uh, uh, what he considered to be his brother cheating him out of the birthright. You remember when Daddy said, go out and hunt me some venison and I'll give you your blessing, and Mama heard that, so she prepared some halfway prepared meat already to, or closer meat anyway, uh, for Jacob. And Jacob went in and said, I'm Esau. And so... Uh, Isaac blessed uh, Jacob uh, thinking he was blessing Esau. Esau became very angry at that and swore to kill his brother. And remember the, uh, when, when Jacob came back from Paran where he went to get his wife and, and uh, Esau was coming to meet him with 400 people and Jacob thought there was going to be a war so he sent you know, drove after drove of livestock down to give him a gift and so they never did have a war. But apparently Esau was never appeased. I mean, they kind of parted halfway friends and peaceful, but they never really, uh, I don't think, had a great love for one another. When uh, Moses later uh, led uh, the Israelites out of Egypt, and he came up to this land, and he wanted to go through the land and come around the Dead Sea and up to the Jordan River, which he ultimately did, uh, Edom said, no, you can't pass through our country. You can't even use the highways. Said, well, we, we won't take anything. We won't even drink water or bend a blade of grass. We'll stay right on the highway. No, you can't come through our land. And that's going to figure into the prophecy of Obadiah. Let's look through the book and get the gist of the book of Obadiah and see what, um, see what we can learn about this brief book and why something like this would be in the Bible. Chuck, let's start with you, if you would, please read verse number three. The pride of thy heart has deceived thee. Thou hast dwelt in the cliffs of the rock. He hath cast his tie, that saith in his heart, he shall bring me down to the ground. Now, that's a literal statement. Thank you, sir. Uh, you're, pr you're a proud nation. Well, what were they proud about? They lived up high in the rocks. They thought they were in a very defensible position. They could not be brought down. You can't conquer us. Nobody can get up here and defeat us. I wish I had the pictures. I will try to get them and post them on the website. Um, somewhere I've got pictures, and uh, I looked for them today to put them in these slides, and I couldn't find them. But I've got pictures. Now, not during the days of Obadiah, but later, uh, after the Babylonians and beyond, the Nabataeans inhabited this range, this same area of the, of the cliffs, the sandstone cliffs that were here. And they went into the, to the rock and they carved out the rock and went back in and their buildings were all like inside. There are some amazing pictures of elaborate uh, construction it looks like somebody just built up a building. I mean, you got the columns out front, the portico overhead, and all the elaborate uh, engravings and carvings and everything. And inside, you got rooms and rooms and rooms, and they just go back. And it's all just dug out of the, of the mountainside, right back into the, to the, the rock of the mountain. And that's the kind of uh, region here that Edom is living in. It's a, it's a high, rugged, mountainous, a lot of sheer cliffs. And they thought, you know, we're here, and we are uh, we're going to stay here. Verse number five, if you would, please, Carolyn. If she that come to you is love of thy might, oh, how you would be cut off. Would they not have said until they had enough? The great gatherers that come to you, would they not have left you blaming? 
you know, if, if, the, if the thieves come at night, they'll just take what they want until they've got enough or they got all they can carry. If the grasshoppers come or somebody, uh, the grasshoppers, the, uh, the gatherers uh, the come in and take your grapes, uh, the harvesters, they'll take what they need or what they can carry. And they're going to always leave something behind. That's not the way it's going to be when God comes through. God's going to wipe you clean. There won't be any of you left. The Edomites were ultimately completely obliterated from history. None left. Let's look at uh, verse number seven, Dwight. All the men in the um, treasury seat shall force you to the border. The men at peace with you shall besiege you and prevail against you. Those who eat your bread shall lay a trap for you. No one is aware of it. You had, a, you had this... Um, alliance with other nations, other tribes. You had people that were friendly with you. They are going to be the people who are going to take you down. Even their friends were going to turn against them and defeat them. God was going to use those people. It was God's judgment. It was God's decision against them. But those people who were in that alliance were the, were the tools that God used to punish Edom. We haven't seen yet why God's going to punish him. We talked about it. We haven't seen it in the text. Why God's going to punish him. But that's coming up. Look at verses 8 and 9, Francine. Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Edom, and understanding out of the Mount of Esau? And thy mighty men, O Heman, shall be dismayed, to the <clears> end that every one of the Mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. Teman we had last week on the map as one of the major cities in Edom. But look, the wise men, the understanding men, the mighty men, these are the people who are going to be uh, carried away. They're going to be uh, destroyed out of Edom. And he's not going to just take the weak and the uh, people who can't defend themselves. He's going to take the strongest and the wisest of the people. Verse 10, where do we come to? Alvin, is that yours? Verse 10. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off from for, not from, but forever. Here's God's charge against Edom. You were violent against your brother Israel. That's a great lesson to us. You know what is it? First Thessalonians chapter one. Those who trouble you, God's going to trouble them. Right? Remember that passage? And here's an example of it. He's already done that. Edom was punished because they were violent against God's people. That's why God sent a prophet to a heathen nation. God's protecting his people. It's just that simple. Yeah. Where do we come to? Verse number 11. Verses 11 through 13, if you would, Chuck, please. Let me read that. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou was one of them. But thou, uh, thou shouldst not uh, have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger, neither shouldst thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither shouldst thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Look, when Israel suffered, you laughed about it. No, you did more than that. You went in and helped the people who were afflicting them. And after they were carried away, you went in and you took what was left for yourself. It belonged to Israel, and you took it. That's what God is condemning Edom for. That's why this prophecy against Edom. He said earlier, you were violent against your brother. Here are the specifics. Here's what they did. They encouraged and then stood with the oppressors, and then they plundered the uh, people. That is, they uh, took the possessions of Israel after Israel was gone and no longer able to defend themselves. 
This is the heart of the book of, of Obadiah right here. This is the reason for the prophecy. This is the reason for the condemnation that God makes against Obadiah. That's probably something you're going to want to remember for the future. Verse number 14 then, Chuck, if you would. Uh, neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossways to cut off those of his that did escape. Neither shouldest thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in the day of distress. <laughs> did you hear that? Some of the Israelites, as they were being carried away by the Babylonians, escaped from the Babylonians. And they were getting away. And Edom stood in the crossroads and blocked their advance, or retreat as it were, the progress, and turned them around and gave them back to the Babylonians. That's who Edom was. <laughs> That's why God is pronouncing judgment against them. And when you look at all these details and you see what Edom did and you see how God reacted to that, as a beautiful lesson for us in the New Testament. God will protect his people. If you, wanted to, if you wanted to preach a sermon about the providence of God protecting his people, just go to the book of Obadiah and preach the, uh, an expository sermon right out of these 21 verses because that's exactly what's going on here. There's a very harsh condemnation that's written in this book, but it's a condemnation against the people who have afflicted the people of God. So it's a great lesson of encouragement to the people of God to read this book. Okay. Some of the books in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, you kind of have to read backwards that way. Because when you look at this thing, it seems like, oh my, what a horrible picture. Yeah, but it's a picture against the heathen who have afflicted the righteous. So there's a blessing to the righteous here. When you look at, for example, the um, book of Ecclesiastes, it sounds like, wow. This is, uh, you know, uh, go in to uh, try everything in the world and just get all worldly all that you can. And that sounds like that's what he's saying to do. I went and did this and I went and did that. But at the end, he says, but now, <laughs> looking back on it, the whole thing was vanity. The whole thing was, was, was meaningless, was pointless, was valueless. The only thing that makes any difference in life, the only thing that's good in life is to fear God and keep his commandments, Ecclesiastes 12, 13. You have to understand that verse 13, 14, before you can make sense of any of the rest of the book of Ecclesiastes. Again, as I say, reading it backwards, so to speak, because inside out or whatever. Because all the way through the book, it sounds like he's saying one thing, and really the message is the opposite. Here, the same thing. It sounds like violence, 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 but the message to us is a message of peace and comfort and protection. Because all this violence is directed against our enemy, those who would hurt the people of God. Let's look further. Verse number 17, Carolyn. Jacob's going to come back. Israel's going to come back from captivity. They're going to possess their land. You know, you can stand opposed to them all you want to. It ain't going to do no good because you're going to go down and Israel is going to go up. They're going to be strengthened. They're going to be fortified. They're going to have their own land. All right. Let's look at verse 18. Go on. God said to Jeremiah, I will make my word in your mouth fire, and this people would, and thou shalt consume them with my words. Same thing here. It's a figure of speech. Israel isn't a fire, and Esau isn't stubble. Okay? It's, it's, it's a figure, an image by which God is, is illustrating. Esau is going to be destroyed, and Israel is going to be uh, the survivor in this whole thing. Verse number 19 and verse number 20. Francine. And they of the south shall possess the mount of Esau, and they of the plains the Philistine. And they shall possess the fields of Ephraim, and the fields of Samaria. And Benjamin shall possess Gilead, and the captivity of this host of 
of the children of Israel shall possess that of the Canaanites, even unto Zarephath, uh -huh. and the captivity of Jerusalem, which is in Sarephard. Sepharad. Again, he's just he's being very specific. This chunk of land, that chunk of land, that, here's going to be there. Where's Edom going to be? <laughs> they ain't going to be nowhere. Edom isn't promised any good thing here. They're just going to be gone. And all their land and all the land around them is going to be given to others uh, by uh, Almighty God. That's the book of, of Obadiah. Thank you for studying with this Confirming the Church's program, produced by Skyway Publishing. Confirming the Church's exists to encourage and assist churches to adhere to the original teachings of the Apostles of Jesus Christ regarding the organization, doctrine, worship, and work of all churches everywhere. Study guides, books, tracts, and essays in print and online, as well as audio and video productions on disc and online, are employed to this end. All are free of charge in the English language and in several other languages to mission churches around the world. To request the lessons of your choice or an in-person seminar with our evangelists and teachers, please see our listing and information at www.skywaypub.org or call toll-free in the U.S. and Canada to 844-650-3223. May God bless you today.